In this video, we will be talking all about routers and routing. So if you've been doing this for a while, or if you're new to networking, I think there'll be something for everyone in this video. What exactly is a router on a stick? Come along and let's find out. Let's start with the definition. What is a router? A router is the device that connects two or more networks. Routers forward packets between networks and act as a gateway to other networks. And routers primarily operate at layer three of the OSI model. Routers know how to find other networks. Well, kind of. They only know the next step, or in this case, the next hop. When configured for dynamic routing, routers also advertise networks to other routers. But we'll talk more about that later. As I said, routers do not have the full path to get to a destination network. They only have the next hop. And this is really what a route is. A listing for a network and the next hop or next router in the path to that network. And to store all these routes, routers have a route table. Routers that only use static routing have a manually configured, non-changing list of routes on their routing table. Let's take a look. In this example, we have three networks, network one, network two, and network three. These networks are connected by router A, router B, and router C. Router A is a part of network one, and that is called a directly connected network. It does not need a static route to that network. In fact, the router adds that route to the route table automatically. But router A is not directly connected to network two or network three. So for router A to be able to find these networks, we add a static route to network 2, 192.168.2.0/24, and the next hop is router B. And then we add a static route to network 3, which is 192.168.3.0/24, and again the next hop is router B. In a real routing table, this will be the IP address of router B that router A is directly connected to, but I'm just keeping it simple here. And this is the key to static routing. The next hop must be an IP that the router is directly connected to. When we configure a static route, we're telling the router how to reach a network. So the next hop has to be something it can already reach. So let's quickly fill out the rest of our static routes. Router B needs two static routes, one to network one, 192.168.1.0/24, with the next hop of router A and another to network 3, 192.168.3.0/24, with the next hop of router C. And finally, router C needs two static routes. Network 1, the next hop is going to be router B. And network 2, of course, the next hop is also going to be router B. So it all seems pretty manageable at this size, right? Just three routers and six static routes. But it gets messy fast. Let's add three networks to router C, and add one to router A. Now, because of these new networks, we need to add three more routes to router A and add one more route to router C. And router B needs all four of those routes. You see the problem? Even with a small network, every new network means new routes on each router. There's got to be a better way than this. And there is. It's called dynamic routing. Dynamic routing uses routing protocols to handle the routing for you based on metrics. Common routing protocols are BGP, OSPF, and EIGRP. To use routing protocols, you just enable and configure them on the routers. The configuring part is you telling the protocol, number one, what interfaces or network to use. Number two, telling the routing protocol which networks to advertise. The advertising part is a router saying, hey, here's the networks that I know about. And number three, which is optional, setting metrics to fine tune which routes are preferred. Let's look again at our routing diagram. Now, with the routing protocol configured, the routers can share routes. Let's listen in to router A. Router Alpha reporting. I have eyes on network 1 and 11. Forward these through me. Over. Now router B tells router C its route and the two it learned about from router A. And router C shares its routes with router B. This is router Charlie. I've got networks 13, 23, and 33, I think. Confirm. 
Currently, three more incoming routes, Alpha. Whoa, where'd all these routes come from? You guys having a route swap meet without me? So there really are some big advantages to dynamic routing. Number one, easier to manage. You don't have to manually add or update routes on every router. The network mostly updates itself. Number two, choosing the best path. Routers will usually choose the best path, but sometimes they need a little help in tuning from us so that they can see the best path. And number three, failover. If something breaks, the network can quickly find another path to keep things running and reduce downtime. If we want to use a router to route between subnets on a layer 2 switch, we could use a router with four interfaces, one on each subnet, like this. But this looks pretty complicated and messy, and we really don't want to do that. So let's pull these all together and make a VLAN trunk. We can use 802.1Q VLAN tagging on one cable on the switch and router to do this. And on the router, many times we will use subinterfaces like G1.10 to accomplish it. This setup is called a router on a stick. The stick part is that single connection between the router port subinterfaces and the switch's trunk port. Just keep in mind that with the router on a stick, all of the traffic between subnets has to go through a single link to the router, and that can slow things down. A layer 3 switch avoids this by handling routing internally on its fast backplane. So even though a router can do this, a layer 3 switch is going to give you better performance. So what happens if you only have one router and it breaks? What if you can't afford to be down at all? There are several redundancy protocols for routers. Two of these protocols are HSRP, which is Hot Standby Router Protocol, and VRRP, which is Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. A common setup for these protocols is that at least two routers will share a virtual IP, sometimes called a VIP, to act as a default gateway to clients. Like in this setup, where the dot .2 and the dot .3 router share the dot .1 address to act as a gateway for clients. This way, if one of them fails, the other will continue to act as the dot .1 router and clients don't notice the failure and, best of all, no downtime. So let's talk about some security best practices for routers. We want to use long passwords, like 16 characters or more, with uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. Next, we want passwords to be encrypted in config files and backups of the config files. Real encryption too, not just obfuscation. Next thing, we're going to use encrypted management methods. We want to use SSH and not Telnet. We want to use HTTPS and not HTTP. And we want to use SNMP version 3 and not version 1 or version 2. And the one thing we never want to do is allow management access just wide open from the internet. That's really just asking for trouble or just asking to be hacked. For another security best practice, use a centralized access control like Radius or TACX. So each admin has their own credentials and doesn't share logins. With centralized access control like this too, there's no need to touch 25 routers when someone joins or leaves. And another best practice here. We want to use access lists to lock down by IP any kind of management access like SSH, SNMP, or HTTPS. And let's not forget to set up logging for management access attempts and changes. And maybe the most important, let's keep our firmware up to date and patch when vulnerabilities are discovered. Thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you did, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And whatever you do this week, don't be router Charlie. Stay tuned for more networking and cybersecurity videos. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.